Hey, welcome to the Publish, Promote, Profit podcast with me, Rob Kosberg. Every week, I interview thought leaders and experts who have used the book to grow their income and their impact. So tune in weekly for these interviews so you can learn how to use your own best-selling book and go from hunting for clients and opportunities to instead being the hunted. All right. Hey, welcome, everybody. It's Rob Cosberg back with a, another episode of the Publish, Promote, Profit podcast. Really excited to be with you today with a great guest, Alan Hunkins. He is a best-selling author. Uh, he is a leadership expert, sought-after speaker, consultant, trainer, and coach. Over a 20-year career, he's led over 2,000 groups through multiple different countries. Clients include uh, Walmart, Pfizer, Citigroup, General Electric, State Farm, IBM, General Motors. You get the point. The man is the expert on leadership. I'm excited to have him today uh, with me to talk a little bit about his new book. Also share maybe some leadership secrets. Secrets, cracking the leadership code and sharing how you can do that as well. So, Alan, great to have you with me today, my friend, and thanks for being on the podcast. Well, thank you for having me, Rob. I'm really excited for our conversation. So, tell me, you know, leadership hits every aspect of life, right? I'm married for over 30 years. I have three boys. I better be a decent leader, dad, hopefully mentor. Maybe they still listen to me. Tell me a little bit how you started diving into leadership as like this core expertise of yours. What intrigued you about it? What caused that initial surge, if you will? Yeah, sure. First, I'll say thank you for naming the fact that leadership is pervasive in every aspect of life. So yeah. some people think, well, I'm not a leader. I don't have people reporting to me formally. Scratch that. Look, my definition of leadership is much broader than that. Basically, yeah. anytime any of us are trying to get anyone else or even just ourselves to get something done, that's leadership. Right. So the fact is, if you use that definition, we are all leaders every day. The question is, are we all effective leaders every day? And that's right. the real challenge. And how I got into this is probably pretty unique. So I grew up in New York City. That's not very unique. I was <laughs> raised by a single mom and my grandmother, mm. also not very unique. The more unique part about my upbringing is that both my mother and my grandmother are Holocaust survivors. Oh, so my wow. mother's born in, in 1935 in Belgium, which is my why my name is Alain. I've got this very I like to say it's pretentious for Alan, you know, it's, it's, so it's, <laughs> I love uh, it. <laughs> yeah, Alan. So my older brother's name is Serge. Anyway, my mom's born in 35. So if you know your World War II history, yeah. the Nazis invaded Belgium in 42. My mom, from the time she was seven until she was nearly 11, was actually separated from her mother and put into hiding through the Belgian underground. Wow. And miraculously, they both survived the war and were reunited. So I share all that context because these were my primary parents who were very much shaped by an incredibly traumatic experience. So the vibe was so different than it was over when I was at my friend's houses or when I was with my dad on the weekend. And so I think early on, I was trying to figure out why are these things so different? So I was always really interested in people, also super attuned to sensitivity and nuance. So I was one of those sensitive kids. Yeah. And then I studied psychology. So what I've come to realize, if we look at if leadership is about influence of people, you've got to be interested in people. And mm -hmm. so I have just been fascinated. So leadership is this wonderful umbrella under which there is high performance and there's psychology and there's neuroscience and there's history. There's so many different pieces that go into it. So that's how I got interested in it. And then I started working with teams and groups because what I found, having done some of my own professional and personal development work, was the feeling of unleashing my own potential was like better than not that i've ever done crack cocaine but if i did <laughs> this would be better i was like oh my gosh this is great this was amazing that sense of empowerment and that liberation and the freedom that it brought that's what i love to help others to do and like i have a very clear personal mission which is around kindling the fire of brilliance in people so that we can create a more vibrant and alive world mm. Well, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks for sharing a little bit about your history. I'm from a Jewish background. My family was also in New York. The Jews kind of came through New York to immigrate. Uh, fortunately, well, we escaped Russian persecution 
the late 1800s, and I was mm-hmm. also raised by my grandmother. And I remember mm-hmm. my grandmother and great grandmother, which she still had a Russian accent, would talk a great deal. And they were, in many ways, the leaders of our family, which was very interesting at that time. I wonder, was it similar for you? And did that play any kind of role in you being a man and saying, I want to take on more leadership responsibility as maybe my dad should have? Just yeah, wondering. Great question. Yeah. I mean, traditionally, if you look at, and again, cultural and Jewish families, it's very common to have the matriarch be the head of the household. Right. And in our family, like my dad and my mom, they split up when I was one. And I think very much part of my own journey has been to try to figure out how can I be that father that I didn't have for right. sure. And I was asked the other day, I was mentoring a group of young men and they said, what's your biggest success? It has nothing to do with work. It has to do with the fact that I've got a 17-year-old son and a 14-year-old daughter, and I have a great wife and a great family. Yeah. And by far, that is my greatest success, is that yeah. I feel like I've shown up in a way for them that I didn't experience firsthand. Yeah. Oh, I love you that. Know? Thank you for yeah. saying that. I don't remember if I mentioned on the podcast or we were talking before, I've been married 30 years. I have yeah. three boys. I didn't see a lot of that myself growing up. It caused me, I think, internally, maybe not to seek personal leadership, though obviously I must have taken that on somewhere down the road. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, kind of spiritual meaning in my life and to build a better foundation. I love my dad and we're very close and they split up when I was six months old. So very, very yeah. similar. Yeah. Here we are getting into the uh, psychology of, uh, of both of our lives. Did not yeah. anticipate that, by the way. <laughs> Didn't think we were going there, but really interesting to think about, you know, how your upbringing sometimes a rebellion against it can actually cause really good things to happen in your life. Yeah, you touched on such an important thing here, Rob, which is, you know, and I talk about this when I work with leaders too, is, you know, we behave because of our beliefs and we have our beliefs because of the stories that we tell. Mm. And part of the stories that we tell come from the experiences that we had. For example, you know, your parents split up at six months, one year, we each had a story and maybe that story was true, partially true somewhere, but those beliefs create this mindset of what the world is supposed to be like. Mm. And we can choose to follow along with that story. Or like you said, we can choose to rebel against it. And I think one of the journeys of maturity and self-discovery is really stopping and taking stock of your own stories. Because if you don't understand your story and start leading your story, your story is going to lead you. Right. So how do you do that? Like, and I'm even wondering, cracking the leadership code, do you do address these things in cracking yeah. the leadership code? Because that's sure. this is really deep stuff here. Uh, yeah, well, so, it starts, the whole first section of the book has got four sections. And the subtitle of the book, Cracking Leadership Code, yeah. is three secrets to building strong leaders. So those three secrets are parts two, three, and four, okay. which are connection, communication, and collaboration. Right. But part one is all around the context. It's about the mindset of what does it mean to be an effective leader? And so we go very much into the psychology of most people are bad leaders. I'll just put it out there and that's, don't take my word for it. And I did a lot of research. There's 30 (laughs) pages of footnotes and that only about 23% of people think their leaders lead well. So you're looking at 77% of us that are kind of stinky. Yeah. And again, I don't think 77% are waking up every day thinking, today I'm going to be mediocre. I'm going to do a crappy job. (laughs) Like, no, they actually mean to do well. Right. But the problem is it's really hard to be effective at something that you've not ever seen role modeled well. Right. And most of the leaders that we had before us came from this mindset and this psyche. And the story is, the belief is, I'm the leader, I'm in charge, I tell you what to do, and your job is to basically shut up and do it. Right. right? That kind of, we call it the old school leadership or command and control. And that worked to a point when people were all on the assembly line, you know, doing the same repetitive thing, right. eight hours a day, or like Lucille Ball with the cookies on, you know, if you remember that episode, whatever that is. <laughs> Laverne and metaphor. Shirley. <laughs> exactly. Pick your metaphor. Um, and that worked to a point where people weren't being asked to think a whole lot necessarily. Right. Now, right. that's not the world we live in. We live in, and literally, they call it the knowledge worker age. Right. So we need people to be creative problem solvers where people need to be engaged in thinking about what they're doing. So yeah, we go deep into this whole set of what I call the facilitative mindset. Because the challenge for many of us, and everyone can recognize this when I say it, people should nod their heads, which is most people who wind up in leadership roles got there because they were really high performers. They're like, right. hey, Rob, you're a good salesperson. Let's make you the manager of the sales team. Right, right. And you're like, totally oh, no, different no. Skill. 
right. It's a totally different skill set. Right. And so there's a big gap between being a high performer and facilitating the high performance of others. And you don't close that gap by just being a higher performer. You need a different skill set and a different mindset. And so what leaders need to realize is I'm no longer the person in charge. I'm the person who has to facilitate getting the most out of those around me. Right. And so, yeah, we go into this pretty deep in the book. Love it. You brought up something that I've often thought. I want to try to figure out a way to communicate best my question. But you said that 77% of the people don't wake up every day thinking, well, I'm going to be a crappy leader or a mediocre yeah. leader. And that is certainly true. And I've often thought that and even looked at my own personal life where, how do I say, I don't want to be offensive, but I think a lot of people look at developing leadership skills as boring or as I'm not really a leader or I'm not trying to be a better leader. How do you get somebody, the 77%, how do you get them to the point where they begin taking the steps of self-awareness, right? Of, I need to do better at this yeah. uh, for my sake, as well as my wife, my kids, my family, obviously my corporate partners, et cetera. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Great question. And I'll just still that down is how do you coach someone who's not coachable? They don't even know what they don't know. Right. So right. such a great question, Rob. So where I think it starts is helping people only start to change when they have an awareness that there's a benefit to changing or the cost of not changing is so great that they go, huh, I got to change. Right. Fair so enough. for example, yeah. if you go to your doctor and they say, Rob, you know, you've got six months to live unless you do these lifestyle things. Right. My hope is that's a wake up call. I was like, whoa. Right. I need to stop doing this, start doing whatever those things might be. So the fact is people are creatures of habit and we coast along at these things. And once you get into these leadership roles where you feel, hey, I've arrived enough, we tend to coast. So what I would suggest is if you as a leader, and if you want to facilitate this awareness in other people, you need to point out what is it costing you? to stay the same, mm. right? And if it's okay, like if you're okay with everything, if your yeah. life is perfect exactly the way it is, <laughs> fine. Great. But it's the willingness to say, hey, what do you really want? Because yeah. I think a lot of people start to rationalize like, well, you know, the job kind of sucks, but I have a mortgage to pay or I got promoted and you know, it could be worse. I got health insurance. We have a lot of people living these lives of quiet desperation because mm. they've stopped asking the harder questions of, who am I and why am I here? And what do I really want to do? And, you know, look, our culture gives us infinite different ways to numb out, whether it's through activity, social media, drugs, alcohol, food, you name it. It's like, there are ways that you can kind of go from one kind of mediocre place and then go home and like numb out in front of the TV and like not, and your dreams just kind of get put on hold and then they get dusty really dusty. People are listening to this podcast already. You've taken the time to go, I want to do something differently, even if it's just listening to a podcast to be inspired. Yeah. So I say, find those people and those resources that inspire you to want to take a step forward. And let's face it, the challenge with growth is to grow and change. You have to step out of your comfort zone Yeah. because you don't learn in the comfort zone. I like to say that leaders get really comfortable with getting uncomfortable mm. and it's not fun but the more you do it, the less panicky it makes you. That's good. That's really good. So uh, so a great place to start is just, you know, asking yourself, am I really happy with where my life is at? And that could be in any area. It could be in the area of a relationship. It could be the area of your finances. It could be your work or where you live or anything. And obviously, if there's something that you feel like is missing, then that internal desire that you've now uncovered will spur you to taking the next step of growing in your leadership in that area, whatever area that is. Totally. And if I can just add one thing to that is when you're doing that reflection, I'm, am I happy here? I invite every single person listening, do that work without getting the blaring of the mass culture media, because mm. let's face it, advertising and social media for that matter is all designed yeah. to make you feel that you're missing something. Right. Ah, I don't have the newest car. I don't have the newest trophy wife, I, whatever you name right. it. It's so easy to feel less than versus what's really important to you. Yeah. And if that's important to you, go for it. But you know, there's so many other voices out here telling me that I need to do this. I don't know about you, Rob, like I'm active on LinkedIn. That's the only social media platform I'm on. Yeah. And sometimes I'll find myself sort of like mindlessly scrolling through and I'll catch myself going, wow, 
I feel a lot worse about myself than I did 10 <laughs> minutes ago, right? Because it's, it, you can't but help be comparison. You're right. comparing yourself. So right. comparison is the thief of joy. I just wanted to throw that caveat out. Just like watch where you do that work and, you know, protect your dreams because yeah. other people will come along and squash them. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I don't love it, but I, yeah, I, get, I get it. it. Very, yeah, very I get good. It too. Yeah. So anybody, we started really in the beginning of the podcast, anybody, whatever point they are in their life, has to assume some kind of leadership role, at least at the very least over themselves. But I doubt that you wrote the book thinking that the book is for everybody, has principles for everybody. Who in particular, like is your ideal client, who are you putting the book in their hands and saying, okay, before we take the next step with your corporate culture or whatever, you know, I want you to read at least chapters four, five, and six. Like, yeah. who do you think of when you hand that out or, or how you use it personally? Yes, yeah, certainly the target market. I mean, yeah. yes, it's applicable to everybody. So the target market are aspiring leaders in really small to large organizations, right? Good. Basically, people who recognize that, you know, there's this gap between where they are and where they want to be around leading themselves and leading other people. Yeah, love it. Good. I'm not trying to disqualify anybody that wants to grow in their leadership. After all, we've just spent 20 minutes or whatever telling people they need this. And I still think they do. But I also know that as an author, I, I think you had somebody in mind uh, from a business perspective that you wanted, yes. that you saw, and maybe have examples and those kinds of things in the book that those people can very easily kind of slide their feet in those shoes, if you yeah. will. Tell me, maybe just to shift gears a little, the book, obviously, uh, it's done very, very well over a hundred five-star reviews. Congratulations on that. Thank you. And it's Thanks. barely out a year at this point, which is terrific. So obviously people are loving it and getting a lot from it. And to get a hundred reviews means you, you know, you got tens of thousands probably that have bought it and read it. When it comes to not the people that you wrote it for, but yourself, mm -hmm. how has the book helped you? In what ways has the book helped you to grow your authority in this leadership space? Attract new clients. Uh, we like to say it at Best Seller Publishing, make an impact and an income. Any stories or what areas would you say it's been helpful? Oh, it's been tremendous. I mean, so my background, I before the book was published, I've been working in the leadership development space for over 20 years. And I started that journey as basically a full-time employee for an external training company. So I was delivering their content to their right. clients. I got lots of experience. In fact, that's the experience in which I grew up in around this work corporately, which was great. Yeah. However, when you do that, you're seen through a lens, which is your XYZ company's right. employee, and it's their content. And I knew that I had other stuff I wanted to say. And so what the book platform offers me is suddenly it is Cracking the Leadership Code by Alan Hunkins. Right. Therefore, it has it builds this credibility. For me, by the way, it was really important to get a major publisher for mm. that added credibility. So yeah. Wiley, you know, one of the biggest publishers yeah. in the world, published it. I also got some great endorsements from people like Marshall Goldsmith and yeah. Jim Coozes, Dan Pink, Barry Posner, you know, top people in the field yeah. who only would endorse it if they read it and believed in it. Right. So I'm super proud of the book. I mean, it took years and of writing and rewriting and editing. You know, I had literally 12 of my friends all read nearly the final version. And I spent probably another month and a half editing all their stuff nearly full time. So, I mean, that's the level of quality that I wanted to put out there because once the book is out there, it's out there. So what the book provided for me was this platform to be seen as a thought leader in right. the leadership space in a way that without the book, I didn't have. Now, when I approached this whole strategy, you know, you talked about profit as well. I never expected to make money from the books. I'm not looking to use the book to provide revenue for me. If that happens, I get, you know, royalty checks from Wiley bonus. Yeah. But what I really see it, it's a conversation starter. It starts this dialogue, whereas I'm now influencing people to start thinking of me in this way of, oh, wow, how could he help our people beyond yeah. just reading the book? Whether that's through speaking, whether it's through training, consulting or coaching, which I do all of those things. So the book has been this door opener and suddenly people know who I am right. and they want to know more about me. And so part of my journey, and just to kind of back up for a second, like you said, the book's been out just over a year. It was actually published on March the 24th, 2020, 
the week after the entire world <laughs> shut down. What timing? <laughs> what timing, which I was not not part of my master plan, let me tell you that. Um, so what I had to do was figure out what can I do in the midst of this? Because I had this whole vision of I'd be going on a, a speaking book tour. I'd be speaking in front of organizations and associations whereby I could multiply, you know, go to an organization or actually an association where you have 100 people from 100 different companies. Suddenly right. you start exponentially multiplying. That world disappeared yeah. and that stuff stopped. So I was like, what can I do? It's like, well, I can get on a lot of podcasts. So I pivoted around my strategy. So in just over a year, I've appeared on over 120 podcasts, mm, right? Congrats. So, but my mother, you know, it's like, wow, all these people invited you to be on their podcast? Like at the beginning? No, it was me reaching out. I mean, yeah. so it's all the work. And just like you said, also, same thing with a hundred or so Amazon reviews is, you know, many of those people are people who I asked. Yeah. I knew they had read the book, but I made the ask, yep. right? So people don't just do this stuff on their own. And I have a mentor who really gave me some good counsel because I don't know, some of you listening right now might be of this camp. I was a good student as a kid, right? I wanted to please my parents, wanted, you know, good student. And in school, good work speaks for itself. You know, you get good grades, you're a great student and you get rewarded and you get recognized, you get put in honors classes, et cetera. Once you get out of school, the world doesn't work that way. Right. And good work does not speak for itself. So my mentor said to me, and if good work spoke for itself, the field of marketing would not exist. So you need to learn how to blow, you know, toot your own horn without blowing it as it yeah. were like too much. And that's a fine balance. But I think most of us, when we're starting out, we tend to be very tentative about, hey, this is what I'm doing and reaching out because people want to celebrate with your success. So yeah, long story short, it's been quite a journey of getting this out there in the world. Love it. Well, congratulations. Over 100 Thanks. podcasts. I love what you shared as well. I think it's super, super valuable. This is stuff that we teach and help our clients with. You need to ask people for reviews. Your own mother will tell you that she'll do a review for your book, and then she won't know how to log into Amazon and get it done. I mean, just because people have good intentions doesn't mean that they're actually going to do it. When you ask, though, you raise the likelihood of that happening significantly. You're obviously not waiting for this book to accidentally find it itself on the desk of one of your ideal clients, a corporation or whatever, I'm sure sending it to them, you're trying to appear on the podcast and the media that they're listening to, et cetera. So beautiful. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. And just on that note, you know, you talked about that, for example, with reviews, one of my mantras around this when I'm asking for help is reduce the friction. How can I reduce the friction for other people? For example, if I'm asking people to write an Amazon review on my behalf, I actually send them a link to a hidden page on my website, where it's like, here's the prompt, here's the link to Amazon, yeah. and here are some keyword prompts that you can put together. And I have about 30 different words. It only has to be two to three sentences long. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, it needs to be five star. Right. Yeah. <laughs> just in case. <laughs> right. Just in case you were right. wondering, like, we don't want a one star review on Amazon. Thank you very much. <laughs> or a four but, or a four for that matter. Right. Because it brings the algorithm down. Yeah. So you realize. But part of this is you want to lead the horse to water with everybody doing it. The more that you can make things easy for the people around you and reduce their friction, the more likely they're going to do it for you, which is why we all shop on Amazon, by the way, yes. because they've made it so gosh darn easy. Yeah. Like going on any other website and filling out the forms and putting in your card information. Oh, like this is too much work now. Right. Because we've gotten so used to one click, whatever yeah, that means. For totally. You, so. I love yeah. one click. <laughs> yeah, of course you do. <laughs> so, so does my wife. And Mr. Bezos is very happy that you do. <laughs> I'm sure he You've is. You've made him a very wealthy man. No doubt. Alain, thank you so much. I mean, uh, you've exemplified leadership on this podcast. You've shared stuff from your heart. I really appreciate that, as well as like some really good tactical things that I think people can do, whether it's looking at their own maybe lack of desire around leadership and how to maybe start that truck moving, if you will, as well as some specific things for authors, because our audience is mainly the author audience, as well as those that are looking to uh, sure. potentially become authors. So tell us, where can people find best, get more information about your book or offer you a review, secret link, anything you want to give, we'll keep it in the show notes as well. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, the easiest place to go is the book website, which is www.crackingtheleadershipcode.com. Great. Spelled just the way it sounds. That'll take you right to the book page. And there you can order the book. You can also actually download the first chapter of the book and give it a little test drive, a little preview. Nice. Um, that also is linked right to the alanhunkins.com website. So you can learn about all things Alan Hunkins, which is all around leadership, whether it's speaking, coaching, training, or consulting. One of the things, for example, that I'm doing now, I'm partnering with a technology company and we're offering a 30-day 
online leadership challenge, which takes the principles from the book and has gamified it, uses positive psychology and habit formation, and it has really how to practice being a better leader on a daily basis as part of a global community. So mm. we've run numerous of these. The last cohort we just finished had people from 18 different countries. So there's all the information is on the website under the 30 day leadership challenge. Oh, page. love that. Congratulations. I love challenges. I'm running one right now. The uh, five day publish pro profit challenge, 30 days. I imagine you'll run it maybe some other months and that kind of yeah, thing. So we'll be doing it. Highly the recommend year. people take that challenges. You really make great like strides in what you're looking to change in a challenge. So good. Yeah. Well, sure. thank you, my friend. Thank you for being a part of the podcast today. Thank you for sharing. And we'll have all of that set up in the show notes and whatnot for people. Go to your website, get your book, get your information. Thanks again. Oh, thank you, Rob. It's been my pleasure. Great.